Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, April webinar for this month, looking at uh, data inventories and how we can kind of simplify that across the organization. So today is all about improving our data inventories to make them more accessible and help them uh, help help users understand how to develop data inventories in their organization, and then also how to share them with the rest of their organization to really get value out of that. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Spencer and I'm Chief Executive Officer of Aristotle Metadata and today I'm joined by... Hi, everyone. I'm Shika and I'm a metadata analyst at Aristotle Metadata. Okay. And we're here to talk about data inventories. So what we're going to be looking at this morning, this afternoon, need more coffee, this afternoon is a couple of really specific things. So what we're going to be looking at is like, what is a data inventory and why is it necessary? And what are the activities we need to get around uh, in our organization? We're also going to be talking a little bit about the MAST and ideal methodology that we've been developing here at Aristotle um, to help us understand how we communicate those data tasks out to the rest of our organization. And then lastly, having a little bit of a, like before we move into feature demonstrations, we'll be talking through uh, just how we develop that data culture, how we make sure that everybody understands that. Um, then, um, then I'll be presenting a demo, including all those features with bulk importing, building customized data and interviews, and then last showing you like, how we can build custom data set views and how we can use them. And this is something like we have released recently. So it's really exciting to demonstrate that. Um, but we, before we jump into you know any uh, like really specific things about Aristotle, I just wanted to talk about data and you know why why these activities are necessary for our organizations because I think the hardest part about you know any tooling is is really building that culture, getting people engaged with and understanding why this is necessary. So to look at that, I want to look at, you know, what is the current state of data and what is the current state of data sharing? So um, as part of a recent presentation we did for the Australian Government Data Summit, I was doing some research into data and the numbers are actually quite interesting. Um, first of all, the, the amount of data that was created in the last two years, volume wise or number of data sets wise, um, was more than in the last 20. So we're producing data at an astonishing rate. We're producing more and more data in our organizations, and a lot of that comes from duplication. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just may mean that you know, our data is being copied and then enhanced or it's being copied and linked together, or we might be taking snapshots of external data and bringing it into our organizations. So there's this real challenge of, you know, not only are we producing more data, but we're duplicating it and reusing it and getting additional value from it at this astonishing level. So we need to be managing that. Um, as I said, like half of this data is now coming from external sources. So a lot of the times what we're seeing is users or organizations are now looking to do one of two things. Um, they're looking at taking the data that they currently hold internally and looking to share that with external third parties. That might be for government organizations looking to you know, get external researchers to develop an understanding of policies and programs, or it can be coming from the private sector looking to you know, leverage new ways to monetize their data. So looking at ways that they can share that data with others to get value out of it. And then on the flip side, we're starting to see more and more organizations are buying in or bringing data in for those purposes. If somebody's gone about collecting data that's valuable to your organization, why duplicate it? Why not bring it in? And again, that's what's that's what's leading to that effort. So we're, we're, we're trying to do more around data sharing, which is leading to this movement of information. Um, Sam, a quick question. Yes. What external sources are we talking about here? Um, external data sources, that's a really good question. External data sources can come from a really like a number of really interesting places. So oftentimes from the government perspective, we see things like um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics publishing data that's being brought in and then augmented with our own data internally, um, or it can come from other government organisations who are producing open data. So there's often that case where we're taking, you know, openly available or research driven data from government organisations and, and bringing it in to, to look at ways that we can like add, add our own context to it um, to produce new insights. Or the other one is this like continued rise of like data marketplaces. So I know Amazon Web Services has a, a data marketplace where you can look and see what data is available to buy. So again, where, where an organization has collected data, 
um, and has the authority and the right, and, that, and that's a really important part of it. But when they have the right to share that data with others, they're, they're now trying to sell it and monetize it. Um, so again, like those are a couple of the different ways that users are now starting to bring data in for, from a number of disparate areas. And I think that's actually a really good question because that data is often changing as well. So when we buy a subscription in for, for a data source or when we're bringing in data from a third party, um, the data itself might change on a routine and regular basis, but the metadata is staying the same. And that's something that we need to know because, again, if somebody is responsible for buying or bringing in an external data set, having that recorded in a data inventory to say this is data we're interested in actually becomes really important. Thank you, sir. That's okay. Um, and then the last thing is like, and I think this is one of the most important ones is um, every 12 months, the data inventory loses half of its data. Um, or or more, more, more to the point, I think out of date is, is a more important way to say that. And what we mean by that is that, you know, uh, as, a, as an organization continues to use data and, and, you know, implement data strategies, they may be bringing in new data in that yearly, yearly period. Um, data assets may be disposed of, which again starts to, to talk to what needs to be removed from our data inventory or what needs to be recorded as disposed, or our, our data is changing. You know, a lot of our data is collected through business processes, and over that 12 monthly period, our business processes may change, which will necessarily change what our data inventory you know, is capturing. What we're seeing there is you know, a, a data collection that was run you know, every month for operational reasons may run to quarterly, you know, and, and again, that's the kind of information that needs to exist in our data inventory, just so that we know what our data is capturing. So what we're ultimately seeing is organizations are dealing with this really, really complex problem of data and in their organization. And what we want to do is start to look at what a data inventory really means for our organizations. And the way that we're starting to kind of talk about this is the idea of a data inventory, not as a noun, not as an object that you own, but also as a verb. So we talk about the, this idea of a data inventory as an object, but also we want to talk about like a data inventory as an activity that we do, because it, oftentimes we do an activity multiple times. So what we've been trying to, to talk to people about is thinking about a, a data inventory, not as an action that we take, um, not as, a, uh, as an action we take and not a thing that we have. And then the reason for this. Oh. Yeah, I want to ask one question from the slide. Sure. Um, how data inventory as a noun different from data inventory as a verb? So it really comes back to this idea here. It's, 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 it's about helping our organization understand that we want to get out of this mindset of doing it once and hoping that results kind of happen from that. We need to think about it as a data inventory as the activity we take. So often we talk about a, you know, an inventory in a store and, and that becomes a routine thing. So every month we'll do an inventory of what stock we have and we want to start thinking about that in, in terms that people can understand which kind of leads us to a really neat segue of how do we actually build this into our culture? So we want to talk to people about what this means, but unfortunately data can be quite a challenging topic for a lot of people. They can think that it's, you know, it's, it's a, a domain they don't have to think about. It's a topic that can be left to somebody else. And what we want to do is get everybody to understand that they need to be thinking about data. So for this, for this topic, what we've talked about is this idea of treating a data inventory like a garden. And I think this is a really interesting metaphor that we can use because everybody, you know, I think everybody has, has had a chance to have a little bit of a garden. Um, if you're in a townhouse or even in an, a, an apartment complex, you've usually got like a little herb garden that you kind of plant and uh, eventually it dies. Like, um, I, I have that problem. Some of my things live, uh, and then most of my activities in trying to grow uh, vegetables in my backyard don't go well. And the reason for that is the same reason that data inventories fail. So I'm going to talk about a couple of don'ts, and, and Shikar's going to talk about a couple of do's. So one of the biggest don'ts we have is, like, when you plant a garden, you, do thing, you, you don't do things once. Um, and, and then never go back to them again. So we don't, we, we want to get people to, to move away from this mindset that I'm just going to do a data in, inventory and never come back to it. Um, because we don't do that. We don't plant some seeds and then hope for the best. Um, and we also don't expect results right away. Like these activities that we're talking about have a long lead time around them. 
Um, so again, you don't plant uh, some herbs and expect a really nice lush herb garden to be there tomorrow. Um, you need to wait for the results to happen. Um, and the last one is like, you don't expect automation or harvesting to solve everything. So harvesting is one of my favorite terms for us to talk about, because again, you know, this metaphor of, of data harvesting really comes from the idea of us getting results from the field. Um, again, we don't harvest something and everything becomes perfect. We have to do quality controls. Not every, you know, not everything in our garden is perfect. Not everything in our garden is edible. Not everything in our garden is even food. Like some of it, you know, you might be pulling out weeds. We can't expect automation to solve all of the problems for us. So what we want to do is talk about this idea and say, you know, think about your garden and think about, you know, between when you do your spring clean and later in summer, what are the problems that you start to see in your organization? And, and that's a really good starting point for us to talk to people and say, you know, how would you do this? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip over and go, well, I've, I've said a whole bunch of negative things. How, how should I, like, when we talk with our clients about their, their data inventories, what are the, some, some of the behaviors we talk through? Um, so again, like think about garden. What are the things that we do if we have a garden? We do perform regular small maintenance, like like watering plants, checking if the soil is correct or not, like if it's right or not, if there are uh, pesticides or not, right? So same we want to do with the data inventories. We want to make sure that we are doing small maintenance, not for like all registry-wide content, but like for the content that we are responsible for. And then uh, we have to plan like for the garden, we have to plan like, when we are going to water it next, depending upon the requirements of the plant, when, what, and who will do that, right? We have to plan it properly so that it won't die on, on us. Similarly, we want to do with the data inventory. So for the data inventory, we have to plan, like when we want to update the content next, who will do it and what exactly, like what exact change we want. And then the last one is um, we want to track our progress once we know that this is this is done and now it's the plant is, let's say, fruitful. Um, we want to share that with our neighbors, with our loved ones, right? And same we want to do with the data inventory. Once we know that the content is updated, we want to share our results. We want to share the reports, results with our stakeholders, with our internal teams. I, I just want to like go off script and say I've never actually checked the soil of my garden. And that probably explains a lot. And again, that, that kind of talks about, you know, how sharing our results is really important. We don't need to share everything that we get out of our garden, but sharing our knowledge and sharing our experiences and sharing that maybe, Sam, you shouldn't be trying to grow, you know, those particular, you know, herbs in that area is, is a really important thing. So the idea is, again, we want to help people understand why this is necessary. So again, it really comes back to making sure that people understand. I think that, that first one, that regular maintenance, like what are we doing to keep our data inventory up to date? And what can people do to be involved in that? So again, like a lot of us have our Excel spreadsheets or our SharePoint lists or, or our Aristotles. Um, but the idea is we want to get everybody involved and making sure that we have a plan in place so that you know, when people do get involved, they know what they're responsible for because they won't be responsible for everything. Right? Yeah. This is you. Yes, then we want to talk about mass and idle methodology. Mass and idle are the terms that we came up with, but it shares the common beliefs and actions. Mass stands for metadata analysis, standards, and teamwork. These are the four things that we cover in Aristotle metadata. And then on the right hand side, we can see the wheel that tells us like what actions needs to be performed for the metadata documentation and maintenance. And this is not just for like Aristotle metadata. If like uh, you have some metadata documentation even outside the platform. This five steps will help you in maintaining that and documenting that metadata. The first one is investigating an inventory data. So like first you have to make sure you have some data and you want to document it. The second is documentation. This is where you like know that this is the data and I want to have a record that this exact data I'm going to talk about and I'm going to share with people or like public or internal teams. So that's where you document your metadata content. The next one is e endorsement. Once you have your metadata documented, that's when you want it to get reviewed by a registration authority. Means a group of people who can go and see your content and can tell you, okay, that this is correct. Now we can endorse it for internal teams or for public use. Then we do have audit and harmonize terms. You have all the content inside your registry now, but like 
there are duplications. You can do cleanups in audit and harmonization phase, and then is leadership. Like the leadership is like uh, determining that who will be responsible for all the data governance processes, who will have what level of permissions and roles, and then if you want to share your reports with stakeholders or your executive team. And I think the, the part of the reason that we've developed this, part of the reason we talk about it is these are the activities that we want to kind of encourage across the rest of the organization. Now, just as a bit of a preview, one of the things that we've been working on is also some implementation guides for this. And I'm not going to read everything on this slide, mostly because it's all hidden. There we go. Um, so this is a canvas that we've been putting together to help users start to document those processes in a really nice way as well. So again, the idea is, is that we're trying to build some really good toolkits and some really nice frameworks that users can use to understand or people can use to help communicate across the rest of their organization what behaviors will, that we want them to look at. Now, if you're trying to take a screenshot of this, that's totally fine. As you can see, it's all Creative Commons, um, but we will be share, sharing a copy of this afterwards as well. Um, so if you'd like a copy of this, throw a thumbs up because we haven't done one of those interaction things. Um, but what I want to do is I want to talk through two of these particular pieces, and that's that inventory and then that teamwork component. And these are the questions that we want to ask our organization to really get them in the right place to not just to use you know, any tool in particular, but to really start building up that cultural understanding of what's important. So again, about our inventory, we need to understand what are the assets that we're trying to capture and how are we going to be recording it? But also more importantly, how frequently are we going to do that? I don't think there's any one size fits all answer to this. Um, you know, some areas it may be monthly, some places it may be quarterly. Um, for small organizations or small areas that aren't doing a lot of data work, you know, it may just be an annual process that they go through and review everything. But building in that question of, you know, when are we going to come back and do this again becomes a really important process. And then the other piece is that teamwork bit. And, and again, I think we're going to see this in, in a bit more depth in the demo. But the idea is, it's like, who's going to be doing this? Because again, one of the activities or one of the, the mindset shifts we're trying to get people out of is at the moment we think of data, you know, data management as a, as a particular specialist area in the organization. What we want to do is kind of flip that around and go, how do we get everybody involved and have our data management specialists taking on a review and, and auditing process so that they can help train everybody in the organization? And that's where master and ideal become really useful is as a, as a common way for us to talk in our organization and say, what are we trying to achieve today? And what are the things that you need to be working on? Now, I think we've we've kind of talked through a lot around what are the things we should be doing. And, and again, I think I'll leave it up to everybody on the on the webinar to kind of think about how are you going to do that using your existing tools, but we are meta, we are our subtle metadata. So um, we want to talk through a little bit about what we're actually going to be doing. So while Shikar switches the screen, I'm just going to you know kind of tell about talk about what we're going to be looking at. So um, what we'll be looking at in a second is Shikar's going to start to run us through. Um, what are the behaviors that we can expect in Aristotle? So how can we actually start to put some of this into practice? So my first question is kind of leading into this. A lot of people on the call or a lot of people in the webinar and, and watching this after have probably started this activity without even realizing you're starting to do an inventory. You've got an Excel spreadsheet. You've got a SharePoint list. You've, you've started on that journey and you want to get more people involved. Um, one of the biggest challenges is how do you get 20 people all updating a single Excel spreadsheet at once? And it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, and I'm really starting to, I'm interested in bringing this into Aristotle. How do I get started? What are the things I can do to get this process started and bring my inventory in and make it accessible? Yeah, so the Aristotle Metadata Registry have the capability to do all that, uploading an Excel or uploading a CSV using the bulk upload function. And to do that, I'm just going to go to create all. And this is where we can see upload metadata and we can see we can do bulk uploads here. So if you click on this, you have a Excel spreadsheet or CSV. Just select what kind of metadata type you want to do bulk upload for. Let's say it's a data set. Select what work group you want to give access to. It means that a specific group of people who will have access for this data set upload that you're going to do doesn't matter if it's thousands or hundreds or if, if it's 50 only that particular group will have access to that so i can just start to share it with specific teams already yes directly um and then now like every 
Uh, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I think it's working now. Can everyone see my screen now? Can I get the oh, yeah, Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. We'll cut all of that chunk out of the recording. That's <laughs> yeah. why you come along to see these things live. Okay. Okay. So um, I think we're going to start from the, the demo again. The so demo. I was I was talking about the bulk uploads. If you have spreadsheets, like how you can upload it in a few clicks. So I'll just click on this create button. Go to see all. And on this page, if you scroll down, we can see upload metadata here. This is where we do Excel or CSV uploads. So if you click on this upload metadata, uh, type what metadata type you want to do a bulk uploads for. Let's say it's a data set. So I'll select data set. I can select a work group here. Again, this is a set of group that you want to give access to all the content that you're going to upload. Only that group of people will have access to the content you'll upload. And then again, you have to see the template because the system accepts one particular template. You can just copy paste content from your spreadsheet to this template and to download it. You can just click on download. And once you have downloaded it, this is the spreadsheet. Uh, I'll just show you the the template just had the column names. I have just added name and definition for a few data assets. I have kept everything empty because it's not important to like fill in all the details at first at just one time. And then I can see that I have added two custom fields, one technical contact point and like who is the authenticated user for the data assets. So I'll just upload it here from my computer. And that's it. It's uploading. And once it shows us it's 50% done, the system asks you to review all the content. I can see it's 90 data sets that I have just uploaded in just two or three clicks. I can see all the names here. And on the right hand side, I can see the name, definition, all of the custom values. So I can review it quickly before saving it and uploading it to the registry. And once I've reviewed it, just click on Save Metadata. And it's creating all those 90 entries in the registry. Just gonna take a few seconds. So now that these are being uploaded, like I can now start to allocate these out to different areas. Yes. So they're not stuck in that one work group. No, no. Fantastic. You can add multiple people, you can remove, and then you can give different set of permissions to people. Some can just have viewing permission and some can have editing permissions. The upload is complete now, and I can see it's 100% done. Let's click on one of the items. So if I click on this, I can see the item is there, the name and definition that I have added, and the two uh, custom fields that I uploaded in the spreadsheet. So now that this is done, is there like, like obviously, like I might only be interested in one or two of these data assets as a data owner. Is there a way that I can start to share a, a full list of everything that's in the registry with other users as well so that they can say, Probably the, the fields of most interest to me. I think everybody has a data inventory that they're trying to, to kind of build for their own organization. Is there a way that we can start to produce those lists for people as well? Yes, of course, I understand. Um, like we do have 26 ONDC attributes, then we do have some custom fields. Let's say it's around 30 attributes for each item. What if you just want to see a few and that to like everything on a single page instead of just seeing an item? We can do that using data inventories. So if I'm going to click on browse. We can see inventory views here. If I click on these, then this page shows me the list of inventories that I have created with description and which stewardship organization these belongs with. I am an admin, that's why I can see the registry wide uh, data inventories and the different stewardship organization one as well. But if you're just a member of, let's say, my example organization, you'll just be able to see these four. Let's see how these looks now. If I click on this registry wide data inventory, I can see the name of the data inventory here. I can see it's visible to only administrators for now, but I can change its visibility. When was it created? When was it updated? And if I scroll down, I can see that instead of like all those 30 attributes, I was just interested in UUID, name, definition, technical point contact, authenticated user and release date. And I can see only these here. I'm not seeing all the 30 attributes. If I'll scroll to that side, I can see this edit button. So I can just directly click on edit and it's going to take me to the item page. But again, you'd only see this edit button if you have permissions to edit this item. Otherwise, you won't see that edit button. And you can expand it by clicking on this button. You'll see like the complete item here. And then you can download it in either CSV or Excel, and you can share it with any team member who might not have access to the system or your stakeholders or executive who are like really busy and they're just interested in seeing the overall report. 
Um, is there a way that we can start to, like, obviously we've expanded, I can see just this one result. Is there a way that we can see, like, is there an example we've got where we can see all those potential attributes filled in? Like, how do I see the full item? Like, can I share just a single item? So? Yes, you can do that. Um, so I'm going to show custom item templates now. This is a new feature that we recently released. So for that, I'm going to show you how we can create that and how the users can use it. To create those templates, you have to go to admin tools. And again, if I'm going to admin tools, it means that you have to have admin permissions to be able to create those item templates. So I'm going to click on this item templates, managing item templates, and I can see that I have created four templates here. The ONDC 26 attributes, the ONDC Core 10, National Archives, or Freedom of Information. The Core 10 will just have the Core 10 attributes that ONDC said that this is what you should document. So we can create new templates, like we can create as many templates as we want, but let's click on this edit and see how and like what we can do if we are creating a new template. We can give a name, we can give a definition or description. We can select what metadata type we want to create the custom item template for. And then who is it applicable to? Is it just a registry or we want to make it applicable for just a stewardship organization? Then we can select if the status is active or we want to keep it draft unless like we are sure that OK, it's ready to go active. And then that's the interesting bit. So this is the editor template. You can choose, you can drag and drop from left hand side to the right hand side what you want to see in an item page. So these are the core 10 attributes, but if you want, you can add like you can just drag and drop and it's going to add it here. Like I added origin and it's so easy to just remove it. Click on this minus button and that's so it. This helps me kind of cut down how users are going to maintain and yeah. manage the, the, the level of complexity. Yes, of yes. It provides you a simplifying view for the item page. But then if I scroll down under view template, I have the ability to select info box or not if i want to include that info box on an item page or not if i want to choose it just click it if not just for now let's like not check it because usually we do have info box on an item page and then this is the view like this is how my item page is going to look like the name and definition is going to be horizontally like vertically displayed and then these two horizontally and then i can change like how i want to make it look like on the item page from here, if I click on it, see the display of the items are changing. So now it's vertically aligned. If I want it horizontally like this, if you click on it, it, it gives you multiple options. And then again, you can add other fields or if you want, you can just delete it. And if you click on save changes. And now we have created the custom item template. See the name ONDC code and attributes, right? If I go to create metadata, I can see all the four custom item templates that I created earlier, and this is the one we just uh, we just like viewed. And if you click on this create button, for, yep. So what this is giving me is the ability for me to basically share with the rest of my like users, yeah, like a cut down version. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so users will just like see the ten core components that is mandatory to like fill. If you have information, if not, like definitely you can skip it and you can come back later and fill it. This is just this is just going to show you the ten. Things now. Let's. I have like a pre-prepped content. I'm gonna just copy paste it to demonstrate how it looks. So it's a Northwind data set. I'm gonna create a data set for Northwind. A quick definition, and then if I go to Components tab, who has the rights? Let's say it's Microsoft. Modification date for this data set is let's say today. Who is the contact point? Let's say. John Doe. And then these slots, like because I have added that in the core ONDC 10 attributes, like let's say it's protected. Who is the data custodian? Let's say it's Mike Whitman. What's the keyword? Let's say it's a customer record because the data set Northwind talks about customer record. And what is the resource type? I'm using this for training, so let's write it's training data set. Yep, and if I click on create item, the magic happened. See, this is the template that we choose to, like that's how we wanted to see the layout of the item. I can see these two vertically aligned, these two 
and rest all horizontally aligned. So basically, I'm now able to provide a, a simpler and kind of smaller view for my users. Yeah. So rather than being kind of overwhelmed with everything in Aristotle, and there is a lot in Aristotle because we, we we follow a lot of really powerful standards to help users understand and, and manage everything about their data. This gives me the ability to kind of reduce that back and provide those customized views. But what if what if okay? So, but what if I, I really I so as I personally I love the standard. Um, I I think it's really good for us to build ways for users to kind of engage with this information in a little bit of an easier way. But what if I want to review the rest of that item? What if I want to see everything that's available in Aristotle? Is there a way for me to switch back to that original template view? Yes, definitely. We are Aristotle metadata. We are not going away from standard. So if you click on actions, there is this option to show default item page. So if you click on that, this is where you can see again all the Aristotle metadata standard item page. So the name, definition, all the custom fields, the info box is here, the custom fields that we have added. So this is the default page. And if you want to add, add any additional information, again, click on action, open item editor, and you'll see. Yes, yes. Okay. Even if you have created a custom template with five or six fields, you have the ability, like the system provides you the ability to go back to the Aristotle default page. And probably one last thing is like, because because again, like I think the INDC is a really interesting case because they are developing standards themselves and they've talked about their core 10 and the full 26. If I'm working with a user who's, who's you know, time poor and is only able to start collecting those first 10 attributes, are they stuck kind of editing that one template or can we switch those around as well? No, we can switch those. So again, that was the same item. If you click on actions, go back to the ONDC code 10 attributes one. So this was the one we created. If you click on actions again, you'll see this option here to unlink item template. If you click on this, you are about to remove. Yes, I want to unlink it because I want to create it. I want to link it with other custom template. So now if you click on this change item template, if you click in this drop down, you will see all the four that we have created. And if you're interested in like going to the ONDC 26 attributes data set, which contains all the 26 attributes, so click on it. So I'm not stuck to the one. No, okay. no, you, you always have that flexibility to like move around from one custom template to another. And if you click on apply template, so, so this is the page where you can see all the 26 attributes. And again, if you click on actions, go to open item custom editor, you'll see all the 26 here now. So if I go to components tab, see, you can see everything now. So I've got everything. Yes, everything. So all the 26 fields. And I'm gonna go to the item page. Yep. So I've got one last question. And I think this kind of, this goes back to our, our principle of teamwork is again, so, um, you know, we've talked through my particular use case. So I've got this data inventory. I've been working with my organization. I'm following the last principles and I've got, you know, I've got an Excel spreadsheet. And, and I want to switch it around so that I can get other users involved as well. Because again, you know, we want to get everybody kind of taking on some of the responsibility of maintenance just for their one or two data assets. Um, is there a way through the system that I can kind of share a singular asset? So if somebody was responsible just for one data asset, mm -hmm. how do I start getting them um, kind of access and how do I start building them a, an area for them to work in? So this is where you create work groups and Let's go back to my dashboard. So this is where you can see work groups. So as an individual, let's say I'm a user and you have added that in a work group to a specific group of people and I am a member of that specific group of people. So if I click on work groups, I'll see all the work groups that I have access to. Ignore the numbers here because I'm an admin. I can see like all the metadata content, but as a user, you'll just be able to see like one or two work groups and then again a few metadata items, like let's say five or ten. And then you will be responsible for just maintaining those 10, 20 records or 100 records, depending upon your organization size. You don't need to worry about all the thousands or ten thousands of content in the registry. So like basically if I'm working with somebody who you know really is only maintaining a single asset and I just want them to document their content, mm -hmm. I could just make them a work group and put their content in there. Yes. Okay, that sounds really useful. So that's a like, I, I think, think yeah, that's the end of the demo. I think that's the end of our demo. So that is that is that is true. So um, what I'll do is I'll take it back over. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got through that really well. So apologies again for the inconvenience there. Um, I think we just had a little bit of a, a whiteboard issue. Um, but again, I think that's given you a really good snapshot of what exactly we're trying to capture here. So again, the idea that we're trying to encourage users to think about is to think about 
you know, what are the things that you're managing and what are the things that you're responsible for? So often we have our data areas who are managing one or two data assets and we want to give them the power to take that control on. Because, you know, again, going into an Excel spreadsheet with 100 data assets becomes quite challenging, becomes quite scary. And we want to make sure that everybody kind of has the capability to, to maintain their part of the garden. Um, as we said earlier, like one, the way, one of the ways that we're doing this is through the MAST and IDEAL methodology. And after this, we'll actually be sending everybody uh, a bit of an expression of interest that we're going to be launching. Um, so uh, throughout the next couple of months, between now and July, at a couple of different events that I'm attending, um, we're going to start our first MAST certification process. So as we said in the in the beginning of the call, or the beginning of the webinar, um, MAST really is a, a system agnostic platform like it's not just about Aristotle because our journey for for you know any metadata registry starts with our first spreadsheet it starts with our first conversation with a data owner to ask them what are you doing to keep this data up to date so on these dates so we're going to be hosting a couple internationally actually so there's one in, uh, coming up in Canberra quite soon um, there's one at a conference that we're participating in in New Zealand and another one in Canada. Um, and then we're doing two more in, in mid-July just to start getting feedback from the rest of the community. So if you're interested in those, again, throw a thumbs up right now because that's always good to see. Um, but if you're interested, we'll be sending out an expression of interest in the follow-up email for all of the people who've been on the call. We'll also be sending one out to our, our mailing list later this afternoon as well. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about how you can communicate into your organization about what, what they can do and what you can do to build a, a standardized way for users to engage with the challenges of data governance, please, please register and continue to come to these webinars. Because again, what we always want to talk about is what's good practice and how is Aristotle helping to bring that good practice into place. Um, and with that, I think um, we're, we're kind of at time. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll leave it open for a couple of questions. Um, so we, we did run a little over time, so apologies for that. But if there are any questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, we'll stop the recording here and we'll be posting this on YouTube with that chunk in the middle kind of pulled out. So if, you missed, if you're watching this on YouTube, we have some technical issues and we'll shorten the video for you. Um, but if you've got any questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat. We'll provide any answers. And um, if not, we'll, we'll start winding things up. So if there's any questions, throw a thumbs up or or um, type it in the chat. Throw a thumbs up if you enjoyed the call and, and if you're if you're like I don't know, like is there are there any questions from people online? Or do we all enjoy it and, and understood everything except for the little chunk in the middle? I think I think everybody's excited. Yeah. Uh, getting, we're not getting any questions come through. So um, what we'll do then is I'll just stop sharing so you can see us again really quickly. So again, I'd just like to say thanks everybody for, for attending today. Um, really appreciate your attendance. It's always good to share, you know, what we're doing and what we're seeing in, as, as best practice across our organizations. What I'll do then is I'll probably let you. Yeah, thank you all for your time and sorry about the glitch in between. Yeah. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to Post them on community and we'll definitely get back to you. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. How do they get to it? Oh, I can I can share the link. So it's community.aristotlemetadata.com. Um, and if you're interested, you know, always, always uh put any questions up there. That's usually where we share stuff as well. Um and otherwise it was really good to see everybody. Thanks again for coming yeah. along and we'll see you at the next webinar uh, later in May. Yeah, thank you everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye everyone.